Welcome to I Drink Your Podcast. Oh gosh, it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. You leave me no choice. It comes the smolder. Wait, you like that? No. I don't like that. No, I don't like that. No, how about that? You like that? Eh, a little better. Bread makes you fat. Does this count as annoying? Just tell me what you want me to fuck. Not you. Not you. And not you. Okay, I think it's time to take off your clothes and jump me. A million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? I drink your podcast. I drink it up. Welcome back to another thrilling installment of I Drink Your Podcast. With me today are my wonderful co-hosts, Emily. Hello, everyone. We're installments. That's so fancy. I know, right? Yeah, we got Dylan here with us, too. Hey, everybody. And my name is Ben. And before we get started, I'd just like to uh, thank everyone for listening. Please like, rate, subscribe, share us with a friend or two. And follow us on social media for as long as social media lasts which Elon Musk is doing his best to make sure that that's not through this week. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. But before we jump into talking about Tangled, let's go with what's in our glass. And Emily, what's in your glass today? Well, I needed a glass because I see some tall drinks of water over here. Yeah. Sexy, sexy. Mm, mm -mm. <laughs> oh, no. Is that a sex thing? <laughs> a tall drink of water? Fuck yeah. Yeah, it's like a pickup line. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. cool. I was wondering, it didn't work on Mother What's Her Face, Mother Gothel. Yeah. Didn't well, work I on mean, her. Look at the look at the person it was coming from though. It wasn't gonna work. So handsome. That guy was three so sheets handsome. to the wind. <laughs> Speaking of, Dylan, what do you got in your glass? Well, I've got a nice little uh witch's brew type of thing. I've got some diet Pepsi and SoCo in my little in my big old Ooh. glass today. That's like a high school drink. Yeah, baby. Sitting by the fire. It's a children's movie, so. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> there you go. Tied it in, It baby. came out when I was in high school, yeah. Shut up. <laughs> what about you, Ben? And at last I drink McLight. My depression <laughs> fog is lifting. That's beautiful. I know, right? Light your lanterns, bitches. <laughs> I need that on a t-shirt. <laughs> and then, like, Rapunzel with the lanterns around her. I need, like, her painting. I need that. We can make that. That's the, uh, <laughs> that's the Disneyland After Dark t-shirt. That's right. The kids are gone. <laughs> well, Dylan, I'm sure something you've been watching recently is not kid-friendly. Yes. What is it? All right. I am a lover of true crime. Uh, do you, either of you guys like true crime documentaries, podcasts, anything like that? I like some of them. I liked Making a Murderer and the first season of Serial, but I, right. I don't dive too deep. I haven't seen anything or listened to anything, but I'm sure I would like it. I just prefer other things. All right. Well, what I got for you guys right now is brand new on Netflix. Killer Sally, which is the story of Sally McNeil, who was a female bodybuilder who murdered her bodybuilder husband. And it's all about the secret kind of life behind the curtain of what these people, how these people lived, because they seemed like in the bodybuilding circuit as kind of like the perfect couple type thing. You know, they were both winners. He was a big, like, uh, national champion type. He never won like Mr. Olympian or anything like that, but uh, he was up there. And just one day she claimed that uh, he was beating her. And so she got a gun and shot him. And it kind of goes into why was that? And what kind of uh, reaction this had with her kids and, and all that kind of stuff. So I thought it was really well done. It's only three episodes long. So it's an easy, you know, Saturday night watch type thing. So I really liked it. I, I thought it was really interesting. So it's not much of a mystery. It's, you kind of know right away that she did it, but it's finding out the backstory and the why. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. The, the why. Why did it lead up to this moment? Emily, if you're looking for a good true crime to get into it, I would start with the jinx on HBO. Yes. 
It's about uh, Robert Durst. Uh, who was a because like, that helps. <laughs> I, I, well, I was going to explain who it is. He's a he was a New York millionaire in real estate who just lost it. His mind, his money, his you'll life? see. Yeah, yeah, all of it. I've watched it like I know at least two or three times over because it's so intriguing. It's so interesting to watch. But I would also, if I could suggest another one for Miss Emily, um, the vow. That's also on HBO. That was the Nexium cult with uh, Keith Raniere and how he had like Allison Mack from Smallville uh, was uh, convicted. Oh, yeah, in yeah, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like they were branded women. And it was a really weird, really weird thing. At, at first, it was like a self help thing, and then it just spirals into this weird other world. So I know Emily pretty well. She should probably not watch that one. And stick with the jinx, which is a little more lighthearted. Let's go even more lighthearted now yeah. with our discussion around Tangled, which if anyone wants to watch it, just go on Disney Plus and watch it like five times in a row. Because right you there. can do that. It's, it's right, right there. there. Everyone has Disney Plus. <laughs> Tangled is currently at 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. It was nominated for one Oscar for Best Original Song for the song I See the Light. It likely would have received a Best Animated Film nomination that year, but only three movies were nominated in 2010 for Best Animated Film. What? Ah, the kingdom. It is beautiful. Clapping, dancing, general merrymaking, not a care in the world. At least for most folks. See that handsome fellow running for his life? Is me. They just can't get my nose right. And that tower? Well, in that tower, there lived a girl who was just waiting for her life to begin. We really hit it off. How you doing? This movie was directed by Nathan Greno and Byron Howard. Nathan wrote Meet the Robinsons and worked in the art department as a story artist for Brother Bear, Chicken Little, Bolt, and Meet the Robinsons. So that mid-2000s, he was a Disney art department worker. Byron was the director of Bolt and also went on to direct Zootopia and Encanto. He also worked in the art department for Pocahontas, Mulan, Lilo and Stitch, Brother Bear, and Chicken Little. Chicken Little is so good. Chicken Little is not good at all. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) I thought I, for some reason, was thinking Chicken Run. (laughs) And then I remembered what I was saying. Chicken Run is really good. Chicken Chicken Run is is really good. Not good. (laughs) Starring in this movie is Mandy Moore. She was an early 2000s pop star with the songs like Candy and I Want to Be With You. She starred in The Princess Diaries, A Walk to Remember, Saved, and Southland Tales. She was in Princess Diaries? Yeah, she plays like the uh, the, the the bitchy girl that's always mean to yeah. Mia. I do not remember this at all. It wasn't a huge part. Got it. No, but it was her first one, yeah. She also appeared in Entourage, Scrubs, and How I Met Your Mother. Her co-star in this is Zachary Levi, who starred in Big Mama's House 2 and Elvin and the Chipmunks, The Squeakquel, <laughs> but is no- most known for playing the lead role in Chuck. So good. I could have pegged you for a Chuck fan. That makes sense. Yeah, of course. We used to watch Chuck in my AP Lit and Comp class. I mean, is that like when I used to show Mythbusters, the teachers didn't want to teach that day? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Or or if we were just like, let's watch Chuck, and he's like, okay. <laughs> wow. He was not a good teacher. <laughs> Dylan, from the back of the DVD cover, what is Tangled about? When the kingdom's most wanted and most charming bandit Flynn Rider hides in a mysterious tower, the last thing he expects to find is Rapunzel, a spirited teen with an unlikely superpower. 70 feet of magical golden hair. Ah. Together, the unlikely duo set off on a fantastic journey filled with surprising heroes, laughter, and suspense. Tangled. I have a couple comments on this real quick. Yeah, let's and do it. My main thing is that they define her hair as 70 feet long, and I fucking love that because <laughs> one of my main critiques was 
I need to know how long her hair is and I need to do a bunch of math on it. And I just didn't want to do any of that effort. So now that I know that it's 70 feet, I can decide if that is feasible or not and move on with my life. Well, is it feasible? Well, I have to do some calculations and I'm not going to do that right now. But I think spatially you can just look when she ties it up into like that little braid. (laughs) is Is she fitting 70 feet of hair into that four foot braid? I mean, probably you can you can probably make it work. It looked like those girls like kind of double braided it almost. Well, it was lots of layers. So the thing about this DVD cover is that it makes Flynn Rider be out to be the hero of this because he's the first one you're introduced to in the DVD synopsis. He's also the first one that's introduced in the movie. Correct. But this movie I don't feel is the Flynn Rider story. It's definitely not. But how else are you going to encourage not just girls to go see this movie? Why can't boys go see princess movies? I'm not saying that. I'm saying Disney made the choice to call this Tangled instead of Rapunzel because they were worried about gendering this movie too much when it came to advertising. And there was a reason why Flynn Rider had such a prominent part. You just blew my mind. Is that really why they did that? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes. It's it's a huge controversy all over the place about like, that's probably why some of like, they had the issue of Princess and the Frog Mm -hmm. not doing as well. And they blamed that it was drawing like old school animation. But then people brought up, well, it could be the marketing team because Princess and the Frog is a very girly sounding thing. Well, it could also be that you you created the first black princess and then turned her into a frog for three quarters of your movie, too. I mean, fair point. It's still one of my favorite Disney movies ever. I still love it. Well, let's let's keep talking about Disney movies, because this one, I feel, does really well what a lot of the Disney Renaissance movies did, which is build strong characters and fun songs into their movie. If this came out in that Renaissance area of like 90 to 2000, where do you think it would rank for you on that list? Because in, in that time period, you have Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King, Pocahontas, Hercules, Hunchback, Tarzan. I feel like this movie for me definitely ranks higher than a few of those. Probably Pocahontas. I was never a huge Pocahontas fan just because of the songs. Like The songs are beautiful, but I felt like they're, the music wasn't as great Mm -hmm. but also even little mermaid i like the villain in this and i love ursula like she is a fucking amazing villain but i really like the villain in this i love mother gothel i think she is an incredibly interesting portrayal of gaslighting before we like had a name Mm. for it and i also think it's really an extension of the Beauty and the Beast Stockholm Syndrome sort of feel to it. And I I love that, where there's this guilt and drama between them, and there's a lot more depth. Okay, so it's, are you saying you like it more than Little Mermaid? I don't know if I like it all of it okay. more than Little Mermaid, but I think it's it's up there. I think it it might it might beat little mermaid for me i haven't like fully thought this through ben i'm just talking out my ass yeah i don't know if you remember this emily but the first conversation we ever had about movies was us having the disney renaissance argument of what's the best of the four little mermaid lion king beauty and the beast or aladdin and i know you picked little mermaid i did dylan where does it rank for you well if we're uh gonna put it in there with that uh 1990s in that in that grouping personally my favorite first of all is probably aladdin it was one that really like robin williams was just fantastic but that's beside the point he does kind of win it (laughs) yeah probably go aladdin lion king and then maybe beauty and the beast and tangled so like a like maybe like a third or a fourth place I'm not a Lion King guy, so I, I like this one more than Lion King. I understand it. I do. But I just, I love it so much. And 
there there is no way this movie can take over Hunchback for me because Hunchback's music is just so fucking incredible. If you get rid of the gargoyles, it is probably one of the best Disney movies ever made. Or if you tweak them to make them actually funny in mm-hmm. a better way. <laughs> uh, but I I struggle with the idea of Lion King not being up there too. Also, I love that you wrote Circle of Fire. Oh shit. <laughs> You're not a Lion King guy. No. Nope, Circle of Fire. <laughs> well, when it comes to Disney Renaissance movies, one thing that they all had in common is kind of songs that fell into certain categories. And I'm sure people have, have heard them mentioned before, like the I Want song, the villain song, the romance song, and then the group number. And you know, sometimes there's a fifth category of like defining the themes of the exposition song, like Circle of Life or Beauty and the Beast. And I feel like the songs in this movie rank up there in all of those categories as Mm -hmm. better representations of those types of songs. Yeah. So I want is her song in the beginning. Yep. When will my life begin? Yeah. Is the I want song. Yep. You've got mother knows best as the villain song. Because there's other renditions of it too, which is just delightful. You've got I see the light, which is the romantic song. Which is really fucking romantic Mm -hmm. not just as a song but like the ambiance of it is just incredible yeah we'll definitely talk about that and then the group number is i've got a dream which is one of my favorite group numbers fucking fun it's so fucking fun yeah you're right if you just base it off that it it definitely does an incredible job of fitting in that disney renaissance well i would also say uh having somebody like mandy moore who I think is actually a really good singer. I, I, you know, she came out when like it was Brittany, Christina, Jessica Sim, you know, I think she just kind of got lost in the shuffle. I think if she was out a little after that kind of phase went away, she probably might've been a little bit bigger, but I think she's a good actress and I think she can, she can sing really well. And I thought this was good casting in that sense of getting somebody who's a really talented, good singer to do this movie well i don't want to leave my boy zachary levi hanging either because he crushes i see the light Mm -hmm. he really does yeah he does no that was him actually singing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah they sing it together at the oscars too Mm -hmm. okay because if you remember they do that a lot with some of those disney movies where they'll get you know somebody famous and then they can't sing so they get somebody else I think they stopped doing that after High School Musical, the original. I think they got a lot of flack for that and moved on, especially when it came to animated movies. It was like, why are we doing this? You know, when you have a voice actor in an animated movie with a different singing actor, I feel like many of the voice actors in previous Disney movies had different singing voice actors. Yeah, they did. And especially when with those Disney movies that were doing it in the nineties, you weren't even casting big names in the roles. Like I think of Mulan, how they got uh, Leah Salonga to do the singing in it, but it wasn't her who did the voice of it. So it's like, which makes no sense, which makes no (laughs) same thing with um, the the voice of Aladdin. You had a different voice for the song, the singer and a different voice for the actor. And if we can't remember the names of either of them, like what's, what's the point of that? Like if it's not a big name to marquee it, Mm -hmm. why do that? I would also say that I don't know why Disney didn't maybe reach out more to um, get a lot of, I don't know if they used a lot of Broadway actors at at any point in the, like the nineties when you really didn't need a huge name because Disney animated movie really kind of did. Was the name? Yeah. Was the name. (laughs) You could have gotten Broadway actors, you know, you could have gotten like a Kristen Chenoweth to do something. You you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. You could have gotten major Broadway stars to do these and would have been just fine. And you would have had them singing the whole thing. Of those four songs that we talked about, which one's the weakest for tangled. Yeah. It might be the, I want, uh, you disagree with me. I I strongly disagree with you. You think it's the villain. I do think it's the villain song. Come at me. I would agree there too. Yeah. I like the presentation of it in the movie. Lyrically, I, I'm not a big fan of the song. I, okay, I like the I tone. I like that. the feel of it. But the lyrics are just kind of leave me leave me hanging. And I can see why maybe you think the same thing with 
when will my life begin? Because what's presented on the screen is, is even better than the song. I feel the montage of her slowly mm-hmm. losing her damn mind as we realize how long she's been there and how little there is to do. I just think that that's a really strong visuals for a song that maybe again, lyrically isn't as strong as it could have been. Yeah. I think you completely took my answer away from me because <laughs> that was my complaint is that the song itself I love Mandy Moore's singing in this. I think she does a very beautiful job. But generally, I didn't think the song itself was as heartfelt I want. Like you could get the emotion behind her, but the lyrics and even the way that the song progressed musically, I didn't feel like it had the same impact. And you're right. The villain song has some intensely gorgeous and fun villain elements. Mm -hmm. And I think that that definitely adds to it. And so I can see why you think that the lyrics don't do much for for you. But I feel like the performance really is a lot better than Mandy Moore's. And not because Mandy Moore's not good at singing. I just think the way that Mother Gothel's character is and outlined in the story the first part you don't you don't quite know you definitely know that she's bad but you're also like oh she actually seems to love her child but oh there's this undertone and so i think that it just adds a lot of layers to the song especially when we get the second rendition of it mm-hmm. and i i think that that is such an ingenious way of breaking down this villain I think when it comes to Disney movies, a lot of the times my favorite characters end up being um, kind of tertiary characters, not necessarily the main characters. They're the ones Mm -hmm. that are just there to kind of fill out the universe. Are we going to have the same favorite character? I don't know. Mine's the guy who collects ceramic unicorns. (laughs) No, we don't have the same. (laughs) But I do like him a lot. Oh, so that's your winning? Yeah, we'll see. Well, save let's it. transition into that right now. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. So we're in the good, bad, and the weird. Tell me, Emily, what won this movie for you? Maximus, 100%. Mm. He won my heart immediately. Just the animation and also the way that they portray him as like this dog slash person, like with his qualities and traits. And just the different tendencies that he has. He's very structured and military horse, but also he is extremely silly. He has a character arc and has growth, which I think is just amazing. I even think his voice actor, whoever does the the whinnies and, and sounds, I think is just so fun. And he's just an, a great antagonist for Flynn Rider. And you're just like, I want to root for you. I want you to win. and. and <laughs> But you you see this growth, and I think that the animation 100% stands out, and his interactions, I just fucking love him. 100%. Wins all the way. It's, it's, it's a good pick. Dylan, what do you got? For me, again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but um, I got to go with the casting. The cast wins it for me, because it's just an all-around great ensemble that you had in in there especially i would say with like the voices you got for uh in the i have a dream scene you know you had uh brad garrett and you had a lot of like classic disney guys who have been in disney stuff and in pixar stuff jeffrey tambor jeffrey tambor uh mc ganey who's done a lot of disney stuff too paul f tompkins who's Oh, yeah. hilariously funny he was in there too but you know i just think that's really good to get people who are not necessarily famous but at least you're not just going like okay here's thug number one who do we get you get ron perlman oh. that's what you get but there there again you got a great act a great character actor to do that voice even though he's in it for what a total of maybe 15 minutes And he plays the Stabbington brothers. Stabby, stabby. (laughs) Yeah, but he is so, but he's so, his voice is just so perfect for that type of a character. And I I like that Disney is focusing more on that now about getting well-rounded people to be all through the movie, not just, you know, getting some random voice actor. 
I mean, they got to start somewhere too, Dylan. <laughs> With Pixar, it's given Disney a lot more clout to get people like that. But I like that they're using it to get people to, to do these movies. Guys, my winner is a very personal thing for me. Does it have anything to do with the name that you have on the screen? It does. Oh, no. Guys, for the first 25 years of my life, oh, Lord. I was really into blondes. Oh, God. And then Flynn Rider cut Rapunzel's hair and turned her into a brunette, and I am a brunette guy now because of this movie. <laughs> Rapunzel's hair, after it gets cut, and the way she looks is gorgeous. I am so into that look. Let me just tell. I so okay. I'm, I'm telling on myself a little bit. That's okay. That's your winner. That's my winner is Rapunzel's hair. My God! After it's been cut, it truly changed my life. <laughs> okay. Wow, Ben. But I did have other favorites in this movie. Okay, thank that. God, because I was like, "Geez." <laughs> <laughs> the scene where Rapunzel is cycling through the emotions after she just left the tower. I fucking love that. Oh my god, that scene is so good. Just the perfect encapsulation of what a child with like morals and empathy would experience as they're like it, going through rebelliousness for the first time. I love it so much. <laughs> I hate to say it, that's that's even at me at 40, I still go through that every now and then <laughs> when I do something and it's just like, oh man, this is going to be so great. And then Externally you, have that... you do, not internally? Internally I do. Uh, I go through it where I just kind <laughs> oh, of like, absolutely. Oh. Mm-hmm. But the external part of it is what really makes it. Because I feel like us as adults, we acknowledge that and go, yeah, we all can feel that mm -hmm. inside of us. But you're right. As a child, just figuring out what rebellion is. Yeah. So adorable. <laughs> That's my favorite scene in the movie. I do love that one. Mm -hmm. I also really love the artwork and the details throughout this movie. and. I'm talking like, did you notice that when the Mother Gothel was hiding the flower, those vines were the same vines that were covering the cave to the tower? Oh, I thought no, that I was really that. a oh, cool I detail. Um, even just like the tower itself and it, everything was just really beautiful. But I really want to call out Rapunzel's artwork that she makes is just beautiful. and. I mean, when you have someone trapped in a tower for 18 years, it is feasible for them to become an expert in many things, but still just absolutely beautiful. And I think that when you see it in the castle and in the kingdom too, these similar sorts of art styles, it just completely blows my mind. Especially with the lantern scene, I think just the the colors... That's yeah. actually my my thing that almost won was the lighting in this movie. The lighting in this movie was fucking incredible. The first time I saw this movie was in 3D and that lantern scene in 3D is incredible because all of those lanterns pop. It's it, when you watch it on a screen now, it looks like the ones in the background are like kind of out of focus and during oh, yeah. the 3D scene they all popped as if they were the depth was just amazing in that uh, it, you felt like you were in that scene. So shout out to whoever did the 3d rendering for, for tangled because it looked really good. Yeah. I, I, you know, I got to give it up just in general, you know, when, when Disney walked away from 2d animation, because they thought Pixar was just going to do everything. And then, you know, the politics of what happened there and uh, eventually Disney obtaining Pixar. And then when they kind of went, all right, now we're going to we're going to go into the computer animated CG animated look. I was really kind of scared that they were just going to. All right, let's just make movies that look just like Pixar movies that aren't Pixar. I like that these still look like cell animated classic Disney charm movies. Mm hmm. You know, Pixar has its style and it's a great style, but that's their style. And I'm so happy that Disney went with, nope, we're going to do it. We're going to make it look as much like cell animation as we can. But we know that the 3D CGI is the future. Can we talk about how much I love I've Got a Dream? Because it's one of yes, my favorite please. Disney songs. 
and Eugene's part in that song kills me every <laughs> single time. Oh yeah, can you sing it? <laughs> uh, I'm I can, but I'm not going to. I've already sang enough on this podcast episode today <laughs> about my beer. But I love his part. I love the earnestness with which he performs. While it's also like reserved, like I don't want to be doing this, but you guys are making me. It's just it's a great <laughs> vocal performance that he's able to capture the how Eugene would be feeling in that moment. And I also love that that scene is just a fuck you to DreamWorks. We've talked about that before with Shrek 3. Shrek 3 added in that character of Rapunzel because they heard Tangled was going to be made. So they made Rapunzel the villain in Shrek 3. And then Disney says, hey, you guys in Shrek 3 decided to do this villains are actually good guys joke. Well, I'm going to do it better. And I'm going to put a song <laughs> to it and I'm going to show you guys up. So hmm. I, I love it. I want to call out two last things. One, Donna Murphy plays Mother Gothel in this, and fucking A, does she crush it. And I already talked about how much I love her um, as a character, but her voice and her voice acting is incredible, and I love that her character kind of even looks like her. I, I love that her facial structure kind of looks like her, and so it just brought this really... I, I didn't realize who she was until... I looked it up and I was like, whoa, that? Ooh, interesting. <laughs> and then the last thing that I want to call out is there's this moment when Eugene hugs Rapunzel after he cuts her hair and he's back alive. And it's like this extra squeeze. And it seriously makes me tear up every time because it is just a beautiful small touch that ugh, can't even words. It's so cute. This, that's a good transition into my bad. Because <laughs> you hate that. <laughs> nope, I, I don't mind that. It's the part before that. It really bothers me that Flynn is the one that makes the decision to cut Rapunzel's hair for her without mm. seemingly asking her because mm -hmm. Rapunzel's shown herself as like capable of standing up for herself throughout the movie. And that should have been her decision and her ultimate act of defiance against Mother Gothel. And instead, it's a man solves your problem. And that bothers me. I can see that it kind of the movie kind of does supposedly does lead up to that moment that final that she should have done that yeah and ended it as a woman i didn't even think about that i think i'm so brainwashed i didn't even think about oh a man did this for her because my bad was well wait why couldn't rapunzel just ask eugene to marry her there was like this joke about oh eugene and so I guess I flew past that and went right on to the marriage thing. And maybe it's because I proposed to my husband, but like still apparently missed the nuances of men doing everything, deciding factors for <laughs> yeah. the, the women in the world. I mean, it, it is also the the last thing the movie leaves you with is that little bit of information. That, it's so stupid. Yeah, it's yeah, awful. Like unnecessary. I know we're trying to joke about things and kind of it's not um, breaking the fourth wall exactly, but it is too, right? Because um, he's talking to the audience. Yeah, I guess so. I also kind of see it as more of an epilogue, not necessarily a fourth wall break because okay, his narration fine. the entire time is to the audience. So whatever. Uh, the only okay. thing that I had that was for me that was bad that i could think of is more of a nitpick than anything else and this is something that's in pick general that i'm gonna pick it the one thing that always gets me in movie distance uh because the beginning of this movie starts out you know it takes them what a day and a half to get to the castle for, for How the long festival was she's spinning on her hair excited though but then when we get to the third <laughs> act, when we get to the third act and Mother Gothel takes her back to the tower and everything, Eugene seems to get there really quick. And that's always something that just that just gets me with with movies is, you know, OK, so your point A took you guys two days to get there to, to point B. But now from point B to point A took like five minutes. So crush it, him, that, Ben. Crush that him. always gets me. <laughs> Are Go you? Are you that guy who's like watching 24 and you're like, when does Jack Bauer pee? No. What about traffic? Like no. That's, that, that's the type of all. nitpick you're doing right now. Like I said, this is on it's par. a nitpick. It's not it's not something that I'm going to like go on and write paragraphs 
uh, uh, it's not going to be in your own... manifesto. No, <laughs> it's not going to be something that I'm going to write. That's going to be a defining moment of me. It's like, and another thing, <laughs> movies with distance problems. Yeah. Mm. Well, everybody. Like needs I said, to think. If you wanted me to come up with something that I thought was kind of bad, that's always just one of those things in movies that always kind of gets under my skin. I do have something bad in this movie besides men taking over decisions of women okay (laughs) i was so bothered by the fact that rapunzel makes this big realization that she's the lost princess by looking at her paintings and seeing that she's been painting the sun over and over and over again and it drove me fucking batshit crazy because toddlers don't remember shit like that and I, okay, first off, let's just back up a little bit. She's born and she has like 50 feet of hair. Not really, I'm, I'm being hyperbolic, but so much hair. And so we're like, wait, is she a baby? Is she a toddler? Doesn't matter. Even if she's like two years old, they don't remember that shit. And so the fact that she's been painting this over and over again and sees it in her paintings everywhere. I'm just like, what the fuck? I'm so angry about this right now. Fucking Disney magic. Get out of here. Yeah, I hate to say this, Emily, but I'm going to call a little little, little BS on that because I actually myself have had that experience. Uh, when I was born, I was extremely sick and I was in the hospital for months and they always had the radio on. And in 1982 was E.T. was the big movie. And in that year, you also had um, the Neil Diamond song, Turn On Your Heart Light because that was the song at the end credits of E.T. When I was about two or three, and uh, everybody take a shot, my mother and I were riding, were driving in the car, and a Neil Diamond song came on the radio, and it wasn't necessarily Turn On Your Heart Light. And I looked right at my mom, and I went, I know this guy. I know this song. So that's from newborn infancy to two years old, I knew and recognized Neil Diamond. I'm dying to know what the Neil Diamond song was that was on the radio. I don't know. <sighs> I don't, it might have been Turn On Your Heart Light, but, but I call, <laughs> oh. I, I'm just going to, I don't know for sure. My mom doesn't even remember, but, but she does remember very exactly that a Neil Diamond song came on and you went, I know that guy. I know, I know that voice. I mean, they're similar magic like that in this movie too where the parents recognize rapunzel as an adult Mm -hmm. oh i'm annoyed by that too okay i'm 100 percent annoyed by that okay good because that bothered me too when i'm like she's a brunette how do you even how do you know that that's her how about weird anybody got any weird i mean didn't this is my this is one of my mirrors didn't the king go like she's a blonde (laughs) and they like trace back their their lineage and see like what game of thrones style and figure out what what happened there in the gene pool oh maybe (laughs) but wasn't it because she was a blonde because the magic of the flower yeah but they didn't fucking know that yeah they remember her as a blonde yeah but the mom was a brunette correct yes but i'm talking like when she was born she was blonde why didn't it bother anyone to be like, we had two brunettes and like recessive genes. How did we get a blonde? We didn't actually know this magical flower made her blonde. And then when they see her not blonde anymore and they're like instantly going, oh, you're you're our daughter. We remember you. Just weird, weird shit here. I thought it was weird that Pascal tried to kill Mother Gothel by tripping her out the window. Nah, I thought it was hilarious. Like, he's a stone cold killer, that Pascal. Yeah, we knew that, though, right from the beginning. Well, you can see it in his <laughs> eyes, yeah. I was really bothered, and I still am really bothered, by the just giant eyeballs. And I feel like they were way bigger in Tangled and Frozen, the first one, and they have slowly started to decrease them to be more normal size. But I swear, they're just too big for the female characters. It reminds me of the fucking Bratz dolls. And I'm like, why? Why is this a thing? (laughs) Well, look back at Ariel. Ariel had huge eyes. Yeah. Like, it's a Disney animation thing. Yeah. If Rapunzel's tears are also magic, 
and they they seemingly are more magical than her hair, then why did Gothel waste her time trying to care for Rapunzel? Like she, <laughs> she should have just tied her up and beaten her and bottled a lifetime supply of tears. Done. Very true. Yeah. Then discard her. Dead or alive. Who cares? You're done with her. Move on. She's just a fucking idiot, I guess. She really is. If you let the kid cry once, you would have learned. That's why it's okay to let your children cry, people. <laughs> They might have magical powers in their tears. <laughs> My last weird is <laughs> in the beginning of the movie. Let's go way back there. As the Stabbington brothers and Flynn Rider are escaping. What the fuck? Why are there so many guards for a stupid crown? Like, why do we have this on display? There's so many of them. And when they're chasing them, it's just so stupid to me. <laughs> I mean, that's. The the royal jewels of like England are heavily guarded too, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Like that's that's just a thing. Yeah. Yes, but I'm talking about like the how it just grows and grows and just gets more and more as they're like running after. It's just ridiculous. I mean, maybe crime is low there. Like they have nothing else to do. And that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Super weird. I only had one weird for me, and part of me is. Um, I have to kind of disagree with what Emily was saying about Mother Gothel looking like the the uh, voice actor. I thought she looked a lot like Susan Sarandon. And so throughout the whole movie, I was expecting to hear Susan Sarandon's voice coming out of there. That was my one weird. I mean, this this woman that plays her doesn't look much different from Susan Sarandon. Yeah. But I can I can see that. And plus, we've seen Susan Sarandon animated in Enchanted. We know what she looks like. <laughs> I just thought that, you know, because I, I read up on uh, what they originally wanted for the like Reese Witherspoon was potentially going to be in this and other actors and stuff like that. So I th- I was kind of like, well, I wonder if they maybe had her in mind when they were doing the artwork and everything and they just couldn't get her to. And so they went, OK, well, we'll go with, you know, Donna Murphy. She's she's good, too. Well, let's put a cork in this thing and give our final thoughts on Tangled. And we're going to start with Emily today. I really like this movie and I want to watch it again right now. Everyone should watch it. (laughs) It's a great movie. Probably not my favorite Disney movie, but it's up there. It's a fun one. Dylan? I got to agree with Emily. I think it's a fantastic movie. It's uh, it's fun. It's funny. And uh, it's got a good good story to it. And it's very enjoyable. I'd, I'd watch it again very many, many times. It's a throwback to what Disney was doing in the 90s. I feel like this is the really the first one to, to harken back to the Renaissance era and, and get back to what they were really good at. I do like Princess and the Frog, but that one still felt very different from uh, the Renaissance ones, except for maybe Hunchback. Hunchback and Princess and the Frog probably have a, a lot in common. But I genuinely like this movie. I will continue to watch it. And... I am upset that Frozen gets all the talk, but this is better than Frozen. I would agree. Hot takes from Ben. I think yeah. the songs are better. What's your favorite idea? Mine is being creative. How do you get the idea? I just tried to think creatively. Number one. Rapunzel uses her long hair for a lot of things. Just all sorts of helping her out. I just need to know, what would you use long hair for? If you had 70 feet of magical hair, what would you use it for? If I'm locked up against my will for 18 years, no. toss that hair over the rafter, because I'm hanging myself. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? Now, the magical hair might prevent me from dying. I don't know how magical <laughs> the properties are, but I think that's probably, if, if I were in her position, probably what would have happened. I didn't say you were trapped in a tower. Oh, then what would I use my long hair for? Yes. Um, I would tie a bunch of pool noodles into it so that I could float on the ocean. <laughs> It'd be like a life raft. <laughs> Who knows? It might float anyway. <laughs> uh, maybe. Okay. Um, but really kill myself. <laughs> oh, fuck off. <laughs> Well, I'll just say this. I'd save a lot of money by not having to wear clothing because I would wrap my hair around my body and wear it as clothes. <laughs> like a cousin it thing. Yep. I'd be a nudist inside my house and outside 
hey, you wouldn't know nothing. I'm wearing, you know, I'm just wearing my hair. You know, if you grow your beard longer, you can end up doing that. <laughs> yeah, I know. We'll see. It's a goal, whether you choose to do it or not. And we all have to have goals. Or, as the movie <laughs> it's says, it's good to have goals. Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. We have a cast iron skillet as a great weapon. What other great kitchen items could be your weapon of choice? Cheese grater. Ooh. Perfect. Yep. I've seen Emily just mangle herself on a cheese grater before, <laughs> so I know what it could do if intended to harm. And you've played Munchkin before. You know about the cheese grater of peace. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd probably go with what I'm drinking out of right now, which is one of those nice insulated 40 ounce uh, water bottles. Once you get that thing pretty filled up, you swing that thing around. You're gonna you're you're gonna do some damage with that thing. Yeah, and it and it'll cure your thirst. Yes, and it'll quench my thirst. Yep, fighting <laughs> fighting makes me thirsty. If I was really good with chopsticks, which I'm not, I feel like I could be really deadly with chopsticks. Like Poe. Yeah. From Kung Fu Panda, yes. Mm -hmm. Last question, number three. What kind of ruffian would you be and what kind of dream would you have? We already know Ben's answer. <laughs> well, what's my answer? Oh, wow. You would, have, you would collect ornamental unicorns. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> you don't have to do that one. <laughs> I mean, stealing from my own life, I'd be a ruffian who's really into dinosaurs. And your dream would be to... To ride a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> well since pretty much my biggest love and enjoyment is food i'd say to be able to travel yeah. my dream would be to travel around the world to be able to eat a dish from every country in the world okay well, i mean what's the first dish you would want to go try like if we're starting in america i'm gonna go with the just a good old-fashioned well i don't want to start in america if you're doing a worldwide tour of food where do you go first where do i go you know, I'd probably go to the Middle East because I've never really had Middle Eastern food and I'd love to try it. Okay. I, and I, I can't say of a specific dish because I really don't know what's out there. So you're just going to show up in the Middle East and be like, gimme. Yep. What's popular? Give me what you recommend. What's popular? Okay. Hand it yeah. over. I hope you get to do that someday. Yeah, we'll see. It's good to have a dream. Now that's all agree to never be creative again. Before we go, we'll play a game. Starting with Tangled, Disney went on to make other adjective as title animated movies like Brave and Frozen. And they even had plans for a Jack and the Beanstalk retelling called Gigantic. I'm going to give you an adjective and you need to tell me what fairy tale or children's story I was thinking of when I came up with that title. Oh, I feel like this might get dirty. <laughs> it will not. Oh, okay. This is wholesome fun. This is wholesome fun. Yay! I love wholesome fun. They're gonna they're gonna start off easy and then get harder. Okay. So just shout it out when you think you have the answer. Gruff. Billy goats gruff. Correct. Three billy goats. Okay. Next one. Gilded. Oh, like gold gilded. Oh, so this would be uh, Rumpelstiltskin or no. King Midas? King Midas is correct. Next one. Candied. Hansel and Gretel? Correct. Next one. Windswept. Peter Pan? Nope. Uh, Windswept? Why can't I think of anything besides Dorothy right now? <laughs> Three. No, I can figure it two. out. Two. One. Give us, give us a hint so I can figure it out just for fun. I don't know how to give a hint other than the title. Like, windswept is the hint. Like, it's windy windswept? Nah, not, it's not wind, but it'd be something else. I don't know. Three little pigs. Oh, oh okay. Next one, grotesque. The Ugly Duckling? Correct. Wow. I was going to go with the Hans the Hedgehog story, but that is not the right answer. 
<laughs> I was I was specifically thinking of like a gothic retelling of the Ugly Duckling. Yeah. So I think that would be really cool. Like Guillermo del Toro? Yeah. Oh. Impish. Thumbelina? It's a good guess. Does this have anything to do with The Office? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I thought I'd be a lot better at these, but I'm having a really hard time coming up with those. I used to read a ton of fairy tales all the time, especially the weird ones, and I think that's why I'm struggling. I can't think of like the common ones right now. Impish is the elves and the shoemaker. Oh, okay. Melodic. 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 I really thought I was going to be good at this. I mean, part of it is also getting into my brain, which. Well, I just can't even think of any fairy tales right now. I don't want to go in that brain. Melodic is Pied Piper. No. Fuck oh, off. I was going to try to come up with something. Sorry. Next one. Spun. That's Rumpelstiltskin. Correct. And the last one. Sleepless. Sleeping Beauty? Nope. No, that's Sleepless. Come on, dude. <laughs> uh, Sleepless. In Seattle? I don't know. I don't have the brain power for this right now. Yeah, uh, I don't either. Okay. Sleepless is Princess and the Pea. Oh. It's a good one, Ben. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you for playing my game, and thank you to everyone for listening. Again, please like, rate, subscribe, share us with a friend or two. Follow us on social media at IDYP underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram, or you can email us at idrinkyourpodcast at gmail.com. Next week, we will be watching Best Picture nominated True Grit. That's a goodie. Dylan, to finish our episode, please, in your best Disney princess impression, could you say, I drink your podcast, I drink it up? Well, I drink your podcast. I drink it up well. Beautiful. Oh, goodness. So, someone call a casting director. I was always <laughs> told I had a good voice. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, y'all.